So yes, my name is Ben. I'm a partner at Modern Office and I will be presenting the Atabotics uh, Manufacturing and Office Headquarters today. Uh, it's a slightly smaller scale than the last project we saw. Uh, I will try to do my best to explain it. So a little bit about Atabotics. Uh, Atabotics is a, a local Calgary company that has basically developed a proprietary uh, storage and retrieval robotics system that serves the uh, supply chain management world of e-commerce. And uh, so they have developed everything in-house. Um, they build the robots, they ship them, and they have grown from 11 people three years ago to uh, essentially over 200 people now. So their rapid growth has caught the attention of global firms like uh, Nordstrom, Walmart, Target, uh, even Amazon. Uh, they're starting to, uh, to get their attention as well. Um, and so they approached us to design their, uh, their manufacturing and office headquarters uh, a couple of years ago. So we've been working on this for now for two years. The site is uh, basically on uh, Calgary International Airport land and it sits at the west end of runway 29. So you can imagine some of the uh, regulatory challenges that we uh, had encountered uh, with this site. Uh, the site is about nine kilometers from the city center and uh, it sits on top of an escarpment that has uh, unencumbered views uh, across the prairie landscape to the downtown core and to the mountains to the southwest. This is our proposed building as it sits on that landscape as a, a kind of a beacon. So I'll talk briefly about some of the design drivers. Uh, when we first start a project, we typically look at uh, you know, what, what is considered the knee-jerk response to uh, a certain typology. In this case, uh, looking at a typical office building, they're comprised primarily of uh, a sort of layer cake of similar floors, deep floor plates, not a lot of access to light and view from the center of these floor plates. So we challenge ourselves to do something different that would um, be a little bit more of a friendly working environment. Uh, one of the first things that we looked at, and uh, getting back to some of the regulations that the uh, airport authority has, uh, NAV Canada actually restricts the height of buildings uh, in close proximity to the runways to 23 meters and it's, uh, it, it goes on an inclined plane uh, basically from zero to 23 meters based on your proximity. So we use this to our advantage to, to kind of shape the building uh, uh, in the beginning. And then as, a, as, a, as an environmental uh, response, we tapered the building in plan to minimize the, the northern exposure of the building and really focus on the southern exposure and, and this access to, uh, to light and to view back to downtown. So the, the result is a is sort of inclined pie-shaped uh, building with uh, a habitable roofscape. We've continued the prairie landscape up the roof, but we've also made it uh, an accessible route so that you can get from basically from any level of terraces all the way up and down the, the building. Um, so these terraces uh, basically penetrate this, uh, this habitable roof at certain levels, and they frame contextual views of the mountains in downtown. One of the things we really focused on in this project is this idea of free flow of movement. Um, essentially, there are no corridors, virtually no corridors in the entire building. So we really wanted this, this notion that you could move from one space to another very, very easily, whether it's through the building, uh, upwards, horizontally, or even over top of the building. This section here shows um, some of the, the, the many penetrations vertically through the building that gives uh, the, the users, the workers in the building, uh, many opportunities to, to move up vertically through the building. Um, so we also feel that this uh, really increases the chance for um, you know, sort of haphazard collisions, social collisions and um, uh, you know, social interactions and whatnot. And I think it really enhances the, uh, the, uh, the sort of lifestyle of the workers here. One of the most important features of the, of the, the building itself is what we call the oculus. And this is a six-story uh, vertical penetration through the heart of the building. It's skylit from above. And it allows uh, sun, basically sunlight to come down all the way down through the six office floors and down to the manufacturing level at the, uh, the lowest level. This is a section showing that, uh, that oculus. And the oculus also provides a, a sort of a an informal gathering space where people can come from any part of the floors, gather, listen to the dissemination of some information, and then sort of exhale back into their workstations. This illustration here also shows the primary entry to the building, uh, just coming from the right here, which is essentially subterranean, 
Um, one is led through the main doors and uh, down an extended uh, lobby with sort of uh, mediated glimpses of, glimpses of the uh, research and development side on the left and the robotics testing beds on the right side and then led up the stair uh, this, that is skylit by the Oculus uh, to the second level reception. It's just the building as it sits on the land with the uh, entry court carved into the landscape. There's a the site plan again. Um, so looking at the manufacturing floor, the, the nature of the programmatic requirements of the manufacturing level uh, were such that it was really well suited to a rectangular floor plate. So we paired this with uh, the required um, below grade parking and we sort of submerged this partially into the landscape and then built the landscape over top of the rest of it. Which then allowed the uh, office portion of the building to have its place of prominence on this sort of landscape plinth. Another view of the north side of the building here. Looking here into the uh, manufacturing level below and then the, the wedge of office space above. Moving up through the offices, the, the largest of the floor plates are essentially open office areas that are interrupted periodically by these whimsical uh, pavilions of, of rope. And uh, these, these programmatic elements house such um, uses as meeting rooms, breakout rooms, cafes, lounge spaces, whatnot. And they really start to sort of informally define the floor plates while not having to use the you know, traditional walls and, uh, and, and uh, corridors and whatnot. So they really allow for this flow of movement around them, defining different departmental areas. Uh, moving up here, we see another couple of different uh, interior spaces. The uh, fifth and sixth floors are basically uh, dedicated to the staff. There's a the commercial restaurant for about 500 people. And then the top floor, which is actually our smallest floor plate, is actually given to uh, staff lounge. So the theme here is really um, about the well-being of the employees in this building. Talk a little bit uh, about materiality. The, uh, the building is primarily clad in a polycarbonate panel system, which allows for a beautiful diffuse light to enter into the building and really deeply into the building, um, reducing the need for electric light as well. And the superstructure of the building is entirely uh, mass timber. So we have uh, cross laminate timber floors, mass timber columns and beams, and even the cores themselves are uh, mass timber. I'm going to end here on probably what is uh, the most exciting and most important development uh, to the project since we've submitted it to this uh, awards. And that is this concept of circular design and design for disassembly. Um, looking here at a diagram that we've uh, borrowed from 3XN, thank you if they're here. Um, this is talking about the different components of a building and their different life cycles and how they, uh, life cycles and how they can all contribute to uh, circular design. So if we look at the, uh, the, the cladding of our building is again primarily uh, pre-manufactured polycarbonate panels, uh, mechanically fastened, no use of adhesives or, or sealants. The base of the building is all clad with uh, precast uh, concrete panels that are individually removable for service and access. Uh, the structural system, as I mentioned, is all uh, mechanically fastened, bolted connections, uh, mass timber uh, sitting on uh, precast concrete foundation walls, uh, again, mechanically fastened. And instead of using the um, you know, traditional concrete piles or pillars, we're looking at using screw piles so that at the end of this uh, building's life cycle, the entire building can be removed, even the piles, uh, leaving very little trace. The services are all located on every floor in, a, in an access, a raised access floor. So this allows for uh, flexibility uh, for movement, but also access to the services for servicing and, uh, and maintenance. Um, we're also looking at um, essentially leasing energy. So a company called Bullfrog, which will uh, offset some of the electrical and the power uses of the building with carbon credits. And then the raised access floor itself is, uh, is something else that, was, that will contribute to um, this notion of circular design in that we're actually looking at leasing the floor system itself. So at the end of the building's life cycle, the manufacturer can take this back and, and kind of re-employ it into a, a new project, if they will. So it sort of completes the, the, uh, the circular um, economy there. So that said, I think we've um, designed uh, and sort of an instantly iconic building that sits on a very 
barren landscape. It's, it's austere, it's restrained, but I think it's very appropriate for this, uh, this landscape. Um, but more importantly, I, I, I hope, I hope that we have uh, embedded enough forward thinking uh, into this building that it, uh, it can live on in some sort of other guise uh, at the end of its own life cycle. Thank you. Good. Thank you. Interesting that with the future project we're talking about it already being torn down. <laughs> <laughs> it's but, the new uh, future. Yeah, it's uh, good to see uh, circular economy thinking um, uh, being expressed in the project. I had a couple of questions. Um, one was the staircase on top. It seemed to begin and end uh, in a very hard way against the edge of the building. Uh, yeah. So, so here we're looking at just as a, a section model. Um, essentially, the the stair that you're seeing here is a, basically a terraced means of moving up and down the building, basically from the main level all the way up. One can meander all the way up um, to the top, to the peak of the building, the sort of a Titanic moment, if you will. Can you get in from this bottom part? You back can. Into you the can bottom? get in from this. From this terrace. Okay. Okay. Where's my other one? Um, I can't remember my second question. Over to you, Karen. Yeah. <laughs> um, we saw that lovely image of the aeroplane flying over your bill. Oh, yes, go back to that one. Just go back. I think this for me is the, the most uh, exciting because when you show that sort of nighttime sexy shot you don't really get this incredibly important juxtapositioning of this plinth which is where the workings are happening and the building right so i think really this is for me a lot more meaningful than the image you <laughs> yeah you're touting but this this yeah. is really nice so what is the relationship with the with the airplanes in terms of sound, noise, just as a pragmatic question. Yeah, so there are very strict regulations in terms of you know how we deal with both the noise and the access uh, being so close to the run <coughs> to the runway. So actually, part of the um, strategy for this uh, <coughs> this uh, this terrace is that it's it's all using precast concrete steps essentially, which is an excellent uh, sound barrier, of course. The polycarbonate that we're using on the exterior is actually a double wall system that has a, a what they call a nanogel technology in it, which provides not only really, really excellent uh, thermal barrier, but also uh, a noise barrier. So we're in a zone here that uh, is the most restrictive zone for um, acoustic quality. So as you can imagine, there are provisions within the building, such as you know the construction of the roof and the walls, that, uh, that do act to mitigate that. Thank you. Yeah, also, <laughs> I was thinking uh, maybe similar to you, but why you do you uh, choose the polycarbonate? Is your idea, and my experience, that you cannot open windows in these areas. It's the same here? Correct. And, you uh, can, but we've chosen not to. <laughs> yeah, because then you get this air, the... Yeah. Uh, huh? the you get the kerosene yeah. uh, smell, otherwise you're building. Right. But why do you select them polycarbonate? I just want to understand that. Is that also in, is that a plastic? What, what is it? Uh, and you don't want people to look through it? I want to see it, what you want, not from the outside, but what do you want people to experience from the inside? I would love to hear from you. Yeah, so there's a, an intentionality behind the use of polycarbonate. I mean, first of all, it is a bit of a plastic um, product, so it is, it's highly recyclable, of course. Uh, but it also, as I, as I mentioned, it allows a much more natural light to penetrate deeply into the building so it, it does reduce the amount of uh, the reliance on electrical light um, but part of the reason why we clad the two the, the east and the west sides in in the polycarbonate is that we really wanted to focus on um, really cu curating these views out back to the south so through the clear glazing out back to the south uh, back to the mountains and the, and the downtown area See if we can find a, a Do you have a floor plan where you can people uh, lay out how people sit in this building? Do you have to, that we have a little bit of a sense what exactly is happening? Because it's office space, eh? It's primarily office space, yeah. 
here. So the, lo the lowest office space on the left, um, you can see there. What is the width, for instance, in th that area? Uh, yeah, I don't know what. 100 feet is uh, the third. 35 meters and 3 meters. You're not afraid that at the end you have too much light? <laughs> too much light? <laughs> too much light if you're sitting there, yeah. Yeah, I think, so on this, on this main floor plan here, this actually in, in that point there at the top is a theater. So you can imagine that it would have curtains that would draw around, um, uh, you know, to mitigate some of that uh, additional light in there. Will you get neighbors eventually, or you'll sit in the prairie all alone like this? It's a very, it's a very barren site. Um, and interestingly, this site was, was considered to be not buildable because of all of the, the, the restrictions, obviously. Uh, but now that we've proven this concept, there is the potential. Now there are two more lots next to it, two more sites that, uh, you know, there could be, uh, uh, you know, the potential of a campus, a sort of tech campus that could rise up in future years here. But they would not. They would not. In, they would not hinder the views to the south. So mm. we're we're at the prime location here. <laughs> but, the, but the reality is, if you come here to work, you're here for the day, and uh, that makes it a very special kind of challenge because you can't wander up down the street and find a cafe or a bit of shopping. You're here for the day, yeah. and that's why I uh, applaud the richness of the um, and variety of the, the spaces that you got. But I'm also aware that you're dealing with a company that started with 11 people three years ago. I wrote it down, and now they're 200. Mm -hmm. How many people face a client who wants a building of this size that, for a company that didn't exist three years ago? And so my question is, how do you future-proof this lot? Because you're giving it a very finite form. And mm -hmm. what happens when they come back and say, do you know, you haven't even started building, but we're now up to 400. Yeah. Uh, by the way, you're halfway through, and we're now <laughs> up to 600. What are you going to do? By the lot next door, I suppose. So we, they, they do own other space, uh, just actually down the hill from here. That's the yeah. that's how we met them. We've been working with them for the last few years on space now to accommodate their 200, <clears throat> and they continually expand that as well. Um, this is their sort of their crown jewel. Their it's it's uh, it will accommodate 600 people. Um, they've assured us that. You know, it, it, they're okay with that. They, if they need more space, they'll take more space down below, or they will, they will um, essentially, uh, okay. you know. Okay, so to get this straight, this can take up to 600 people, but it's yes. viable at 200. Yes, absolutely. Okay, I got the picture. Absolutely, okay. yes. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Okay, very good. Congratulations. Thank you. On winning Future Projects Office. Thank you.